In May 1968, astronaut Neil Armstrong, a former fighter pilot, climbs into the bedstead. Fellow astronaut Bill Anders had just completed his turn flying the ungainly machine. It had two rocket fuel tanks, two round tanks, one on each side of the vehicle with a cross feed between them. So while Neil was up there getting the near perfect start, fuel was draining from one tank to the other. Just about prior to touchdown, he ran out of the fuel to control the attitude of this vehicle. So now it was like a kid's balloon at a party where they blow it up and let it go. Armstrong managed to eject just in time. But parachutes are not an option on the airless moon. The lander must work perfectly, and the landing site must hold no surprises. The moon's surface appeared fairly smooth from the vantage point of Apollo 8. Plenty of wide, flat planes where the LEM could set down safely. But close-up photos beamed back from unmanned probes tell a different story. Deep craters, towering mountains, boulders bigger than houses litter the landscape. One scientist warns that the LEM could sink beneath the surface into a thick layer of lunar dust. The landing site must be chosen with great precision and from a quarter million miles away. Charged with this task are two geologists, then fresh out of graduate school, Farouk Elbaz and Jim Head. One of the big problems was if you landed, on, even on a flat surface, on the edge of a crater, some of these craters had slopes of 10 to 15 degrees in the inside. And of course, if the lunar module pitched over and landed, it would just keep going over. And that was not something you wanted to have happen, because obviously you couldn't get off the moon if that were the case. So there were lots of different problems. That would have been a really interesting that one would, right next to here, but uh, I'm not sure it would have been a very safe landing. Yes. <laughs> not the least of their problems is dealing with the competing expectations of the scientific community and NASA engineers. The engineers want to do the simplest possible thing to get the person there and return them safely. And the scientists want to say, wait, we're going to be on the moon. Let's run over here, and that's going to be interesting over there. And how do we get to this? And why land in this dull, boring place? Look at the mountains. And you can imagine saying to a, an engineer, we don't want to land on a flat surface. We want to land on the side of a mountain. Like, whoa, get real. The engineers prevail. The first landing attempt will aim for the edge of a broad, flat area known as Mare Tranquillitatis, the Sea of Tranquility. July 3rd, 1969. As Apollo 11 inches toward pad 39A, the space race ends suddenly in a ball of fire. The CIA learns that a giant Russian N-1 moon rocket has blown up during a test launch at Baikonur. It will take the Soviets months to recover, if they ever can. NASA officials debate whether to pause and catch their breath, but all systems are go. The LEM has been trimmed down to flying weight. Just two days before launch, NASA gives the final go-ahead for a landing attempt. The astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins, know that many peg their chances of actually reaching the moon's surface at 50-50. If they fail, NASA has two more rockets and two more crews ready to go before decades end. On July 16th, over a million people flocked to Cocoa Beach, Florida, across the bay from the launch site. The crowd is filled with politicians, television stars, ordinary people, all hoping to witness history being made.
minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. Collins, a West Point graduate and career test pilot, will fly the command module around the moon. Aldrin, also from West Point with a doctorate from MIT, will join Armstrong, NASA's only civilian astronaut, in the first attempt to land on the moon. Looks like it's going to be impossible to get away from the fact that uh, you guys are dominating all the news back here in Earth. Even uh, Pravda in Russia is headlining the mission and calls Neil the czar of the ship. Four days and a quarter million miles from Earth, the crew enters lunar orbit. You are go for LOI, over. Roger. Go for LOI. All your systems are looking good. Everything looks okay up here. Going around the corner, we'll see you on the other side, over. Uh, going through my mind was a very simple equation in here. Today, we're either going to land, we're going to abort, or we're going to crash. Okay, off flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Lino. Go. Guys, go. Seventy miles above the moon, Armstrong and Aldrin undock the LEM and begin their descent. Capcom, we're go for landing. In Houston, 26-year-old Steve Bales, in charge of guidance control, anxiously awaits data to track their speed and location. When we finally get data, I realize that we're going toward the moon 13 miles an hour faster than we should be, and the computer doesn't know it, and our ground radars tell us. And that doesn't sound like much, and yet it's almost enough that we have to abort the mission. My uh, trench comes up and says, hey, we're not in the position that we expect to be, We've got some velocity errors, and the one that really got your attention, we're halfway to our abort limits. So a holy cow, things are mounting in here. City Ag, 47 degrees. Right. We have a rule that says if it gets up to 20 miles an hour, we're going to stop this mission because you could actually literally crash into the moon and not know it uh, while you're on automatic pilot. Their velocity stays within acceptable limits, but the trouble is far from over. In the lunar module, Neil Armstrong realizes they have overshot their intended landing site. Maybe three or four minutes into the descent, Neil made an observation that looks like we may be a little bit long. And I thought, geez, you know, how can he possibly uh, suspect that? Uh, but it turned out that we, we were a little bit long. Only when the LEM pitches over to prepare for landing can Armstrong get a good look at the surface below, out the pilot's window. They're heading down into a field of boulders. He hits the throttle, hard. I see the vehicle going across the surface of the moon like I have never seen it do in simulations. And I say, what is going wrong? What is, what's going on? It's going five times as fast horizontally. It's never supposed to do that. It's just supposed to gently hover down. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward. We knew that they were not landing where they're supposed to land. We worked on the exact landing point for so long, and we wanted this landing specifically to be very successful and safe. And here they are, not landing where they're supposed to be, and we have no idea where they will finally land. And it was really terrifying to find out that perhaps here we're going to see something that might end the program. With a minute to go, they confront the unthinkable, an abort or even a crash. Armstrong's search for a good landing spot is using up precious fuel. 60 seconds. Lights on. Forward. And then when uh, 60 seconds and the light came on and we were still not real close to the ground, we were maybe 100, 120 feet, then I guess I was getting a little concerned, but what could I do? Uh, could I say, hey, Neil, hurry up, get it on the ground? That would just excite him a little bit more, so I couldn't say that. Armstrong has flown four miles past the prime landing target. He has half a minute's worth of fuel left. 
30 seconds. And you hear 60 seconds, and you hear 30 seconds. And we ever get to zero, we're going to call in a board on fuel, and the crew knows it, and we know it. And about the time we got 30-second call, uh, the crew said, hey, we're kicking up some dust. Picking up some dust. Hey, 75 feet. And we knew then that we were close. And there, I knew that no matter what I would say or do from now on, this crew was going to go in for the landing. Four forward, drift into the right level. So we just shut up here in the ground, and all we were doing was letting them know what their fuel status was. And the fuel is going lower and lower. And then finally you hear contact light. Contact light. OK, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. And then he says something I will never forget. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I didn't know what Tranquility Base was. They have never used that term when we were doing simulations. They always called themselves Eagle. So I said, what is this, Tranquility Base? And then I think, what a wonderful name. I mean, all that in a matter of two seconds. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Gene Kranz has no time to catch his breath. He must quickly decide. Is the spacecraft safe where it stands? Or should the crew launch from the lunar surface immediately to rejoin the command module? We had to look over the spacecraft very quickly, make sure the spacecraft was safe. It wasn't toppling over. We hadn't damaged any of the fuel systems by blowing rocks maybe up into the uh, lunar debris, up into the soft underside of the spacecraft. So I had to do this very quickly. And after about two minutes, then it's too late, really, because uh, if you were to lift off uh, after two minutes after the normal landing, Mike Collins is going round and round, and he's too far ahead for you to catch up to him in a reasonable time. And I just couldn't get the words out to start the stay no stay process. And in frustration, after a couple seconds, I wrapped my arm on my right arm on the console, and I had a pencil in my hand, I broke the pencil in two, and uh, then got over that. It was just pure frustration, got through it, and got on with the stay no stay decisions until we could finally get off shift say, my God, today we landed on the moon. And all of a sudden, the motions of everybody came through. They all got up and clapped. Von Brown was sitting right in front of me. He turned to me and with an OK sign, he said, thank you, John. That's the biggest compliment I've had in my life. The most massive and concentrated effort of science and engineering since the building of the atomic bomb has paid off. The cost has been high, $20 billion, and the lives of 10 astronauts, Soviet and American. But on July 20th, 1969, only eight years after President Kennedy committed the nation to the challenge, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk the surface of the moon. But what is this place they've landed on? This moon that is bigger and closer to its host planet than any other moon in our solar system. What can we learn by actually being there? About its age, its origins, its crater-torn surface. The focus of Apollo is about to change. Armstrong and Aldrin bring back precious samples from the moon that are immediately sealed away in airtight vaults. The first pieces of another world. I was a scientist at the U.S. Geological Survey at the time, one of those chosen to study the samples, and it's, gosh, it's 30 years ago now, but I can remember the excitement of coming here and getting our uh, bits of material. 
When the rocks first came back, it was really amazing because the rocks Neil Armstrong picked up turned out to be basalts, and the ages of those weren't a few thousand or hundreds of thousands of years, but were 3.7 billion years old, older than virtually all rocks we found on the Earth at that time. Basalts like this are made from cooling lava, the holes from bubbles of escaping gas. On Earth, basalts are relatively young, as the planet's surface is constantly reshaped, erasing eons of geological history. But the age of the lunar basalts suggests that any volcanic activity on the moon ceased billions of years ago, after oceans of lava hardened, forming dark areas called maria, or seas. These rocks, before the astronauts picked them up, had lain virtually unchanged for nearly four billion years. Geologists are anxious for more and different samples. Even before Apollo 11, they had lobbied NASA to send a bona fide scientist to the moon. Back in 1965, a group of scientists had been selected to train as astronauts, the first who had not come up through the ranks as test pilots. When the scientist astronauts were selected, they were all nice guys, but who needed them? You know, I mean, they can't fly. None of them knew how to fly. We had to send them to flight school. We felt like uh, basically they were taking up space. They didn't have the qualifications that we felt were essential, and that was to be a fighter pilot, you know, living, breathing, gung-ho fighter jock. There were two MDs, two engineers, one physicist, and a PhD geologist the astronauts nicknamed Dr. Rock. The whole idea of volunteering was with the uh, possibility of uh, actually uh, taking my uh, science and my interests uh, to the moon. Jack took for a long time to get through flight training. I remember at the time saying that uh, if God had meant man to fly, it wouldn't have made him Jack Schmidt. But these guys, they were good. I mean, they were sharp people but they were cut from a different mold. We also felt like they were, uh, would kind of uh, undermine the office on our official positions, uh, which was kind of like anti-doctor, anti-scientist. Hell, we were astronauts. We could be anything we wanted to be. We were a little, a little arrogant. There's no question about it. And it was, and for every scientist that flew, one of us would not. Schmidt would never be completely accepted in the test pilot fraternity, and he didn't expect to get to the moon himself. But he used whatever leverage he had to push NASA to liven up its approach to geology training. My impression was that the pilot astronauts were bored. It was not very interesting to them. Most of the astronauts actually hated geology. They didn't want to touch a geologist with a 10-foot pole because their first courses in geology were taught the way I was taught geology, in a classroom with the thin sections and the microscope and learning the chemical formula of a, of a mineral which they will never see again or never use. And they would tell each other, I mean, we're not gonna get a goddamn microscope and look at this stuff. What the hell are we doing this for? To spark the astronaut's enthusiasm, Schmidt recruited his own source of inspiration from his days at Caltech, Dr. Lee Silver. What I was trying to do initially was convince them that they could make important contributions to the science. Silver led field trips for the crews of future missions including Jim Lovell, soon to fly on Apollo 13, with Fred Hayes. And Dave Scott, scheduled to fly the following year on Apollo 15. In Iceland, they studied basalts, volcanic rock like Armstrong and Aldrin found. At Meteor Crater, Arizona, they found samples of a kind of compressed, fragmented rock called breccia. Finding breccia on the lunar surface could prove that the moon's vast craters were formed not by volcanoes as many once thought, but by the fiery bombardment of meteor impact. 
the astronauts must learn to recognize it. You have to think about these people as not a typical set of undergraduates who are going out on a, a geology field trip. I mean, here are these people incredibly highly motivated, but also very, you, you know, they're very competitive. And before not too long, these people became highly motivated students because they could see that, hey, you know, you get out on the moon, we're not just going to pick up a couple of rocks. You're going to be on the moon for seven hours. And gosh, gee whiz, that really looks neat. Goes about 30 seconds. And you've got to learn some geolingo or you're, you know, you're going to look stupid. We did geology from when we woke up at dawn and could get breakfast to we'll go through three, two, three, four exercises a day till it got dark and then talk geology around the campfire until 10 at night. Fred Hayes and Jim Lovell have become so enthused about geology that they chose as their Apollo 13 motto, Ex Luna Scientia, from the moon, knowledge, and are heading for a hilly landing site, quite different from the flat terrain where Apollo 11 and then Apollo 12 had landed. We knew that the material might be different than it is in the flat areas. We knew there was ejecta lying on the surface thrown up by volcanism or impacts that, we, that they wanted us to pick up because that could tell us a lot about Lunar module Aquarius, coupled to command module Odyssey, is nearing the moon. Everything is going smoothly. It's become almost routine. Trips out to the moon and back are generally very quiet. Kind of boring, as a matter of fact crews kind of going over their checklist, etc. They had a TV day that day where the crew took everybody on a tour of the capsule and so on. And that was winding down and they were securing from that and getting ready for sleep time. Just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back to a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. Gene Kranz went around the room says, before we put the crew to bed, is there anything you want to do uh, before they shut, shut down for the night? And I said, okay, flight what I need him to do is stop charging one of the batteries and give me a crowd stare all four tanks. Four switches, all four tanks, no big deal. Command module pilot Jack Swigert throws the switches to activate fans that stir up the tanks of liquid hydrogen and oxygen. Then, suddenly, the spacecraft lurches as if struck by a meteor. All right, here's the way we've had a problem. We've had a main beam bus vulnerable. And it was a very obvious, uh, abnormal, uh, combination of shock and uh, initial felt motion as well as sound reverberating through the hull. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the uh, caution and warning there. Warning lights indicate problems everywhere. Fuel cells dying. Maneuvering thrusters out. Oxygen tanks losing pressure. It was not until we really saw the oxygen escape from the rear end of our spacecraft that we realized that we were in very, very deep trouble. Then we got that sinking feeling, you know, that searing sensation in your stomach. When you're in deep trouble and don't know how to get out of it. The routine stir of liquid oxygen had somehow triggered a short circuit. The oxygen tank, which fed the electrical system, had exploded. Now two of the three command module fuel cells are nearly dead. This is virtually a quadruple failure. And uh, we, didn't, we just didn't train for that because there really was no way out of it. We really thought that God would not be so unkind as to give us more than one failure at one time in one system. I knew it was an abort, that we'd lost the mission. The original mission, exploring the lunar highlands, must now be abandoned. The new mission becomes, get the astronauts home alive. And I'm down at the Cape, said goodbye to the guys, and I watched the launch. And then I headed for Houston, and then the word came back. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. Without question, I was disappointed. At the beginning of an experiment, you've got good people working on it, you're enthused and all. Priorities are priorities. My concern was for the crew. These are people I worked with. The command module's power supply is nearly spent. Soon its computer, lights, and gauges will be dead. 
the ground directs Lovell, Hayes, and Swigert to use the lunar module as their lifeboat. We figure we've got about 15 minutes worth of power left in the command module, so uh, we want you to start uh, getting over in the LEM and getting some power on that. The LEM has its own power supply, but it's designed to support two people for 45 hours. Now there will be three, and they are at least 90 hours from home. Ground control decides they should continue around the moon and take advantage of lunar gravity to turn them back toward Earth. Then, to get home before the power runs out, they must accelerate their crippled spacecraft by burning the LEM's small descent engine, an extremely critical maneuver that had never been tested. The ground started to send up the instructions to me of uh, how long to make the burn, what attitude, and things like that. And I had my two companions in the lunar module with me when I looked at them, they weren't paying any attention at all. They had cameras in their hands. They said, well, as we go around the far side, we're going to take some pictures. And that's when I told them that if uh, we didn't get home, they weren't going to get them developed anyway. Jim, you uh, go for the burns. Go for the burns. Five runners there, go for the burns. And it worked. Ground confirms ignition. Four burning, 40%. But as soon as it was over with, then we turned everything off. And we had only the radio and a little fan to circulate the atmosphere because we had a safe power. It got very uh, cold and, and very, uh, very damp. My guess is it was somewhere between 35 and 40 degrees. I started having a chills and fever. It was nothing that made me incapacitated or couldn't function. It was just uh, added to the uncomfortableness of the, uh, of the situation. For three days, Lovell, Swigert, and the ailing Hayes huddle in the freezing lunar module. There was little to do but wait and hope their re-entry heat shield hadn't been damaged by the explosion. Then, as they approached the Earth, another potential disaster. When the ground was tracking us, they found out that we were not inside the uh, free return course. And the free return course is a, is a two-degree pie-shaped wedge that you have to come down into with respect to the Earth's atmosphere. We are beneath it, which we could have missed the atmosphere or skipped out, like skipping a stone on water, and we'd be gone. So we had to make another maneuver, but our computer was down, our guidance system wasn't working, our autopilot was off, and we had to do it literally by the seat of our pants. Lovell and Hayes set the course by eye, aiming toward the Earth and fire the thrusters by hand to control the ship's direction. Swigert times the main engine's burn using his wristwatch. The course correction seems to have worked, but will the heat shield hold up? During re-entry, there is always a communications blackout that lasts about three minutes as the spaceship heats up to over 8,000 degrees. Three minutes pass. Then four. The extended uh, blackout period got us. It's the first time I came up and said, something didn't go right. And then I immediately caught myself and said, no, it's some kind of a communications aberration. There's something wrong with the communications. This crew is coming home. I cried. As soon as I saw those parachutes, it was it literally the, the tears flowed. And I think this was true for many of the people. I did return. I did get back uh, from this mission. Uh, but I think it's... Uh, it, it, it's human nature. You, you cannot do the, uh, the preparation and the training and have the investment in accomplishing what was in the flight plan and, uh, and accomplish so little. So there was that kind of a stigma uh, for me that, you know, we just, uh, we, did, we didn't get it done. The crew is safe, but everyone's great sense of relief is tempered by a growing realization Apollo's days are numbered. Funding for Apollo's 18, 19, and 20 is cut by Congress. 
reflecting a shift in national priorities that had begun years earlier, after President Kennedy's death. Before we ever landed on the moon, President Johnson and President Nixon killed anything in the future. President Johnson, because he was having trouble with Vietnam and the Great Society, uh, President Nixon, because I think he was a good politician, and the moon had gotten to be controversial even before we landed. Scientists are determined to glean everything they possibly can from the last few Apollo flights. The new lunar rover will give them more bang for the buck. Lee Silver is delighted. Now his astronaut geologists can range several miles from their landing site and carry hundreds of pounds of samples. Dave Scott will command Apollo 15, the first to take the rover into space. NASA actually stretched the rubber band about as far as you can go. They extended the capability of the lunar module. Uh, the propulsion system was better. The guidance was better. Uh, they added the lunar rover. We had longer duration backpacks, more consumables, more everything. So it was uh, stretching out to the edge. And of course, you know, we get to fly them, so we were really enthusiastic. Dave Scott is an explorer. He saw Apollo 15 as the first extensive scientific voyage. And this was a change from, you know, the, the space cowboys of the earlier times when, you know, pushing the envelope, uh, being the first to do this. I mean, Dave had a real vision of what was going on, and he carried the rest of the crew, uh, you know, with that vision and, 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 and the program as well. Scott's spacecraft, too, has been reconfigured to accommodate the push for lunar research. It's the most fuel-efficient rocket yet, able to carry the extra weight of the rover and a huge array of cameras and measuring devices. There had been so many changes, engineering-wise, to the spacecraft that we thought that maybe something would go wrong. One day I was telling the Apollo 15 group, I'm going to give you a copy of the Koran with the, with the prayer to protect you. And Dave Scott said, please do. We need all the help we can get. El Baz needn't have worried. Apollo 15 arrived at the moon without a hitch, even though its landing site was the trickiest yet, in the lunar highlands between a long, narrow canyon called Hadley and a range of towering mountains known as the Apennines. Hadley Apennine is certainly, in my opinion, the most spectacular landing site on the moon that we could reach. It has a, a rill or a canyon, has enormous mountains, 15,000 feet above you. There's so much to see. And when you've studied the area, and you, you, you think you know what you're looking for, and there's much more, and it's so clear up there. Boy, that's a big mountain when you're down here looking up, isn't it? My, oh my. Oh, look at the mountains today, Jim, when they're all sunlit. Isn't that beautiful? It really is. My golly, that's just super. The Hadley Apennine landing site is located near Imbrium Crater, so large it can be seen from the Earth. Scientists believe the crater was formed by a huge meteor impact when the moon was young. That catastrophic collision must have kicked up rock from deep inside the lunar crust. Geologists Jim Head and Lee Silver, glued to their television screens in Houston, hope Apollo 15 is in a good spot to find some of this ancient material called anorthosite. Anorthosite, that would be the deep crust that we could look at and understand. And Dave went up to the side of the mountain and he looked over and he saw this sparkling crystals glinting at him, which is rare for the moon. <laughs> Guess what we just found? Guess what we just found? I think we found what we came for. Crystal rock, huh? Yes, sir. You better believe it. As a matter of fact, <laughs> oh boy, I think we might have ourselves uh, something close to uh, the north of site. Because it's crystalline. And that is really a beauty. And uh, there's, some, there's another one down there. Yeah, we'll get some of these. Back it up. It turned out to be, uh, we think, a sample of the original crust of the moon made four and a half billion years ago right right after the initial uh, uh, formation of the moon. The anorthosite Dave Scott brought back 
is a jewel in the crown of lunar exploration, the oldest sample yet found. The press dubs it Genesis Rock. Its surprising age and chemistry, along with evidence from the other lunar samples, gradually lead to a radical new theory of the moon. Earth was struck by a Mars-sized asteroid. This giant impact sent a massive amount of material into orbit, which coalesced, forming the moon. The theory, ridiculed at first but now widely accepted, was developed by planetary scientist William Hartman. Apollo itself tied together the history of the moon with the history of the Earth so that it made us aware that we live in this system. We're not just living on an isolated planet, but we have this neighbor, and the neighbor records the early history of the system because there's virtually no erosion there, and the Earth records the last part of the history of the system. But if you put the two together, we get the whole story. The moon's presence changed the Earth in profound ways. Its gravitational pull stabilized the young Earth's wildly fluctuating axis of rotation, setting up the conditions for everything we take for granted about our planet. Moderate temperatures, liquid water, tides, life itself. December 1972. After seven years of debate within NASA, a scientist will go to the moon. Geologist Jack Schmidt will fly on Apollo 17 with mission commander Gene Cernan. There was a lot of pressure from the scientific community for a scientist to fly on Apollo before it was all over. Jack never took no for an answer. He sort of became a pain in a lot of people's butt. And it basically, uh, Deke Slayton, our boss, got a directive that Jack Schmidt would fly on an Apollo mission. And there was only one left, and that was Apollo 17. Three and a half years after Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had set out for man's first lunar landing, the last moonshot lights the midnight sky at Cape Kennedy. The only Apollo night launch is precisely time so the crew can touch down in the clear light of the lunar dawn. Okay, stand by for pitch over. Oh, are we coming in? Pitch over. There it is, proceeded. And there it is, Houston, there's Camelot. Wide on target. I see it. Cernan and Schmidt's landing site is a deep, mysterious valley between the Taurus Mountains and Litro Crater. Stand feet. At contact. Okay, Houston, the Challenger has landed. The astronaut and the geologist are not only on the moon, they're in heaven. I was strolling on the moon one day in, in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May. We were in a valley deeper than the Grand Canyon, one of extraordinary uh, geological variability, one that we now are finally going to have a chance to explore. This is a geologist's paradise if I ever saw one. Cernan and Schmidt have little time simply to sightsee. Nearly every minute is tightly scheduled, setting up experiments and collecting samples. Here's a nicely structured rock that we probably ought to work on. There's a lot of lineation in some of that white material, Jack. Probably the branch, uh, it's got a little dust covered. Look at where the contact between the gray and yeah. the... Uh, right, I, and it's on both sides. Oh, hey, there is orange soil. I can see it from here. It's orange. Even when they stumble upon an unexpected discovery, their time must be carefully rationed. All right, I'll put my visor up. It's still orange. They gotta leave at a certain time, regardless of what we got. Guys, we don't have uh, that much time. I know, Bob. I know. You're gonna leave the moon at a certain time, and you have to work everything in, and you have to get get through that frustration of not having enough time to do everything you want. After three days of seven-hour EVAs, Schmidt and Cernan have collected over 200 pounds of samples. Now their supplies of oxygen and water are nearly spent. Gene 
he's finished with the, uh, the core tube, then we should be able to go. Cernan and Schmidt head back to the Lem, ending the explorations of Apollo. But neither man could have guessed they would be the last moonwalkers of the 20th century. When they write the history books and they say man landed on the moon from 1969 to 1972 and then did not go back for at least 30 years, maybe 40, maybe 50, I hope not, but maybe that long. It'd be sort of hard to explain, I guess, as a historian. We could have run more missions, but in historical perspective, gosh, it's only been, you know, 30 years. That isn't long. When you look at the major explorations in history, there are hundreds and 200 years between the major events. So we're regrouping now. When I started walking up that ladder, I realized, hey, this is it. Uh, somewhat of a nostalgic moment. You looked around, I looked back at the earth and realized I'm never going to be here again. Somebody will, but I'm not. And I wanted to sort of leave a challenge for that, for those who would follow. And, and I wasn't sure what I was going to say until I said it, quite frankly. Uh, and I wanted to, 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 have, to, to have our challenge, the challenge of Apollo, sort of have something to do with the destiny of those who follow. You know, here's the challenge. The door's open, the door's cracked. It's, it, it, you now have the opportunity to go on from here. And, uh, you know, my exact words, uh, we now leave as we once came, and God willing, as uh, we shall return with peace and hope for all mankind. And uh, may America challenge today. Forge man's destiny up tomorrow. Forge man's destiny up tomorrow. The quest that began as a desperate race against the Russians at the height of the Cold War has ended. How ironic that an effort born of bitter conflict produced the most profound images ever seen of the interconnectedness of mankind and opened a window on our common origins. Ironic, too, that it ended so soon the whole grand endeavor, barely a dozen years from start to finish. Today, the abandoned launch platforms loom like some 20th century Stonehenge, monuments to the incredible achievements of decades past. Surely, man will return to the moon and venture beyond. But in the new millennium, it will most likely be private enterprise, not political necessity or even scientific curiosity that will propel the efforts. But wherever we may go in the universe, those first visits to another world, from 1969 to 1972, will always live in human memory as chapter one. Raw, unyielding. Twenty-five years ago, Mike Collins, Buzz Aldrin, and I were preparing to begin a unique journey of exploration. Our aim was to land men on the moon. CDR and LMP, It was to be the culmination of a decade's work. Thousands of people, scientists, designers, astronauts, and technicians had made their own contributions to the space program. We were determined that their efforts would not be in vain. For me, it was an opportunity to bring to bear all the knowledge that I had accumulated during my career. Flying and engineering were obsessions with me. I earned a pilot's license before a driving license. I'd been a Navy pilot and an experimental test pilot. Space exploration seemed the next great challenge, and I, for one, was happy to accept it. We worked day and night for almost eight years with that single goal in mind, landing men on the moon. We did have difficulties and setbacks along the way. Many people risked their lives, and some gave their lives. But for all of us, the dream of venturing beyond our own planet was too powerful to resist. 
we wanted to explore the unknown. We wanted to push the limits of space flight. We also knew that we weren't the only ones with the same ambition. The Eagle has landed. Roger, twin tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Today, the famous Kraft TV cameraman focuses on outer space for another exciting adventure in the world beyond tomorrow. Control deck to all stations. Stand by to raise ship. Blast off, minus five, four, three, two, one, zero. October 1957, and the space age had begun with the launch of the first Soviet satellite, Sputnik. The epical scientific achievement by Soviet Russia in beating the United States of America in the race to launch the first man-made moon has all humanity staring heavenward. For the miracle here simulated may have more profound implications than we mortals are ordinarily called on to grasp at once. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It's a report from man's farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik, the first man-made satellite as it passed over New York earlier today. Man in the streets reaction to Sputnik was, my God, how could they do it? They can't even build refrigerators. And it was really quite a, quite a terrible thing. And the, the man in the street didn't understand really the, the magnitude of what they had done. They put up a 186-pound spacecraft uh, two months before we were supposed to put up a four-pound one. Do you admire the Russians for doing it or not? No, definitely not. I said we should have been the first ones to have it, if there's such a thing. We fear this. We fear that they have something out that majority of the people don't know about. What do you think about America not being able to do the same? Well, if I was in military service and fell down on the job like that, I could stand a court-martial. Somebody's fallen down on the job, badly. According to the latest Soviet announcement, the satellite is still maintaining its speed of 18,000 miles an hour, a dozen times faster than any man has ever flown. The event itself, the sudden Russian advance to the far frontier ahead of every other country, that event is full of meanings, clearest of all the scientists whose work is the exploration of space. Not only did Sputnik's beeps signal the power of the Soviet Union to destroy America, after all, the next one might be carrying a nuclear warhead, it was also a propaganda coup for Russia. From a, a more global point of view, editorial writers and, and others were saying uh, this demonstrates great Russian technology, and technology from this closed communist society uh, versus uh, the technology in the United States in an open democratic society. So at that time in the Cold War period, with a sense of competing for the hearts and minds of uncommitted people around the world between two great political systems. The uh, Sputnik was, was a real setback and a real embarrassment. The politicians tried their best not to show their panic. At his first Washington press parley since the news of the Soviet moon, President Eisenhower is asked if it wasn't a mistake to ignore the fact that we were in a race with Russia. Well, no, I don't, because uh, as even yet, let's remember this, the value of that satellite around the Earth, going around the Earth is still problematical. The Soviet Union has launched a second Earth satellite. Only one month later, Russia had done it again. This time, there was even more to be concerned about. Obviously, the dog was in there because there was some biological interest. How does an organism behave in the absence of gravity, which was a big question at that time? 
And there were some people who were really concerned about this on a cerebral level because it showed that the Russians were thinking seriously about man in space, man in space when we were not thinking about it by order of President Eisenhower, who didn't believe in man in space. And then there were other people who could do such a thing to a dog. This voiceless cry of mercy as this satellite spans the earth should be long remembered as a symbol of the torture the animal world must go through. And I don't mean to be facetious at all, but something to be remembered is that there's a female up there circling Mother Earth. Bud Nixon, Bud Nixon, flying through the air. Bud Nixon, Bud Nixon, flying everywhere. They're so ironic. Are they atomic? Those funny missiles have got me scared. My first reaction, I believe, is the normal reaction of every American. I'm disappointed. <laughs> And so at the moment we're waiting, waiting for the missile to leave the ground, and the next shot will be the Vanguard going aloft. Uh, it is hoped to carry the first U.S. satellite into orbit in outer space. Well, there's been an explosion on the launching pad, and the Vanguard has been disintegrated before it left the ground. So you have just witnessed what will undoubtedly be a severe propaganda defeat for this country. There is a tremendous gap between promise and performance. I believe the American people want action and are demanding that we get going with our missile program. America had another go. Seven, six, United States is ready to try and place its first Earth satellite into orbit. And there is a sudden tremendous burst of flame. We can see the Jupiter-C missile on its way. Our payload is only a, a, a fraction of what Sputnik 1 was and a small fraction of Sputnik 2's 1,100 pounds payload weight in orbit. So. Yeah, again, I can only repeat what I said before. We are competing only in spirit with Sputnik 2 so far, not in hardware yet. Guardians of that pioneering spirit were America's first seven astronauts, Cold War warriors who would protect the country against the evils that lurked in space. But before NASA risked the lives of their newest heroes, others were pressed into service. It seems to me that a potato would be a very simple thing to put in space to, because the potato has a, a very simple rhythm, a 24-hour rhythm. It doesn't have a complicated life pattern. Questions raised by Dr. Brown are behind the space agency plan to shoot a potato into orbit. Dr. Brown is a biology professor at Northwestern University. Dr. Brown and the space agency have worked out plans to take a piece of an ordinary potato and place it into an ingenious space capsule. The capsule is nicknamed Sputnik 1. If the potato cannot survive out of the Earth's sphere of influence, uh, then I would be very, very cautious if I were concerned with the total problem of uh, sending man out into outer space until I had found out what it was that the potato lacked in order to permit it to survive out there. The astronauts continued to look the part while others took the glory. To the world at large, it is the Mercury program activity back at Cape Canaveral, Florida, that is most appealing from a human interest viewpoint. We say human interest advisedly, even though the hero of this space probe is Ham the Chimp. For is he not pioneering the program that one day in the very near future will see a human astronaut in orbit? Ham is not making his daring venture unprepared. He's been in training with a group of his fellows for months. And because he went to the head of his class, he's considered by his teachers as their most apt pupil for the job at hand. The quickest to learn how to operate the levers of his space capsule that will supply his wants while he's in flight. We 
we did have a good many uh, American animals of various sorts. I mean, bunny rabbits and mice and things like that. Nobody really cares about that. We never sent a dog up. We never sent a cat up. We did send a monkey up, but we got the monkey back. That's very important. And here's a new hero of exploration. But Ham seems to say, why the fuss? It's just a day's work. Epic monkey business. That was the weather, and now I look at the news. Half an hour ago, the Russians announced that they'd put the first man into space. navigator is Major Yuri Gagarin. He's feeling well and conditions in the cabin are normal. As he looked down on the earth from the loneliness of space, he streaked across Asia, Africa and South America controlling the pitch and roll of the ship. Shortly after the news was given of the flight, Tom German interviewed Sir Bernard Lovell at Jodrell Bank. I think this is one of the greatest achievements in the history of mankind. It's remarkable when one realizes that this success has been achieved by a nation which a generation ago was largely illiterate. This is Richard Dimbleby in the BBC television studio in London. You're looking, if you've just turned on your television sets today, at the first time, perhaps, to a live television picture from Soviet Russia. Here is a man who has done and seen things that no other living person has done or seen. You remember how he said yesterday that it's possible to see the remarkable colorful change from the light surface of the earth to the black of the sky. This transition from the blue to the dark is gradual and lovely. There's certainly enthusiasm and I can well understand why they feel so enthusiastic. Huh. Within the White House, uh, advisors around the president thought that we should fly another chimp and uh, or maybe two and uh, that Mercury was not quite ready and that we were pushing too hard. But the Gagarin flight, the uh, here again uh, America was a nation of first and all of a sudden the Russians were the nature of the first with Sputnik and they were the first with Gagarin. It was very clear that the Russians were going to be first uh, in almost everything. We should do everything possible to make any sacrifice to help our country be, get up there too. It means they're getting ahead of us and we certainly need to start working hard to catch up. I believe it's uh, very impressive for propaganda purposes, but I think if we put our minds to it that this country can top that in six months. NASA certainly put their minds to it, but in contrast with the secretive Russians, their continuing problems were all too public. We were testing the uh, Mercury Redstone uh, program in the Escape Rocket Blue. And when it did, uh, it took the uh, capsule down to the beach, which was about several hundred yards down the beach, and it blew a big hole in the ground about 35 feet deep. Well, everyone, after we got time to get out of the blockhouse and a few things, everyone wandered down that way, and uh, Alan Shepard was standing there, and he says, uh, you guys have got to do a better job than this because I may be flying on the next one. The rocket is beginning to rise, agonizingly slowly. The astronaut has turned on his clock, and here we go. We're on our way into space with Alan B. Shepard. I'll join you in just a second on another microphone. Well, I want to uh, again express my congratulations to Alan Shepard. We're uh, very proud of him, the Space Committee, who are with us today. And uh, 
this decoration, which has gone from the ground up. Yeah. <laughs> Relief that America had put a man in space if only...